Good morning. Welcome to the Emory Christian Church. It is awesome being here today. I'd rather be here for the best food of home in the world. Amen. 
You can be seated in just a second. This is first Sunday of the month. Didn't say it was Sunday the first, it's the first Sunday. There's a difference. Amen. And what have we been doing for Sunday? We partake in communion. First Corinthians 11 says, For I received of the Lord, that which also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and show this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Well, for whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. But we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Right now, that's what we're going to do. We're going to judge ourselves. I want you to pray, and I want you to ask God to touch you. Remember now, listen, how many is messed up this week? How many's had an attitude? How many, yeah, how many's actually done some good? You've had actions that you'd rather not talk about because of an attitude. Amen. I raise them both my hands. I raise both. Hold on. Okay. See the magic? Magic. <laughs> This has got, listen, communion, when it says eat, drinking unworthily, it's not talking about if you've had any problems this week, okay? If you have problems this week, you really need this, okay? This points to the cure. This is not because you had a bad attitude this week or had some bad actions. You can't take of this. That does not disqualify you. It's the matter in which you take it. If you think you're better than anybody else, or you think you don't need it, or, or you think that you've gone so far that Christ can't handle it, then you got a problem. But you know what? We're all safe. Okay? So here's what you do. I want you to talk to the Lord. Ask Him if there be any attitudes or any actions in your life that you uh, need help with. He's going to help you. And this right here is done. It's an act of faith. This act of faith helps get you lined up with thinking about Jesus' past on the cross, His present with you now, and future being with you in eternity. So go ahead. Open up. First little bit. Get that piece of styrofoam now. Got, got it? First let's pray. Father, touch us right now. Bless us, Lord. Is there anything in our life, attitude or actions that's not pleasing to you? We give it to you, Father. We don't have to agonize before the altar, before we participate in communion. We just have to acknowledge that we have not necessarily been at our best, but we know, God, you still are at your best, and we give it to you right now. In the name of Jesus. Now, take it. He said, on the night of the train, he took the bread, he broke it, and he blessed it. And he said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Go ahead. Now peel back your core, your foil. You can break that tab. We hold it tight though, you don't want to throw it in your throw it in your lap. That same night he took the cup and he said, This is my blood shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You are an awesome God. You are a powerful God. I know you got it. In the name of Jesus, it's yours. It's yours. Let's see. Let's try this one. Let's, maybe we can, y'all think we can do this without music? Let's try this without music. Let's see. I just had a had a epiphany. You can try to play if you like, brother. I'm going to try to stop music. Because it, it's kind of hard to, for me to walk and, and screw chew, chewing them at the same time. Ready? Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder 
very important that we, we keep our minds in the right direction. So, so let me just tell you this. Stewardship is more than money. I get so tired of hearing those preachers just want your money. No, I don't. Honestly, I don't. I don't want your money. But I do want you, your time. Okay? The rest of it will fall in place. What I want is you. I want a relationship with y'all, a pastor to his people. Okay? And when the, and when the relationships are right, everything will take care of itself. Okay? So I'm not here. This is not about money. Stewardship is more than money. Back to basic stewardship. Watch this. Stewardship is actually how you handle your time, <laughs> your talent, and your treasure. Ah, oh, you pastor, I just ain't got time. Well, you know one thing about it. Your clock goes from 12 at night all the way around to 12 at noon, back to 12 at night. You know we've all got 24 hours. How many here got only got 12 hours? You need to give me your watch because it's broke. Everybody in here has got the same amount of time. It's not how much time you've got. It's how you use what time you've been allocated. All right? Amen. It's amazing to me how somebody come to me and they're, 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 they're this, this, you want, you want to get my goat? I'm going to tell you how you can get my goat. If you ever say, let's go get the pastor's goat, here's how you get it. You tell me you're having a problem. And so, okay, and you want to counsel or you want to talk. And I'll get you in, I'm talking with you. And you say, I sure wish I knew what to do with some resources. And I go, well, here. Read that book. And then you tell me. That's one thing you tell me, one thing if I say you got tools and you don't use them, that's different. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this is different. Because we all, I got tools, but when I, me and my wife sometimes when we're getting a heated discussion, we throw the tools out the window. I know I'm not perfect. I know I disappointed you. Okay. But I give you a book and I say, read this book. And when you come back, in a couple of weeks, at least read this chapter. And they go, ain't had time. Really? Did you have time to watch Bonanza? Did you watch Gilligan's Island? Did you have time to go to Walmart? What I've discovered is people make time for what they want. And one thing we don't make time for in stewardship is God. We want His undivided attention, but we give Him scraps of ours. And then we wonder why things go on all two pieces in our lives. Because we want His undivided attention. And I'll get to you when I can, God, because you know I don't have time. Really? I know that was an ouchy moment. But I can tell you, it ouchies me too. My toes, if you can see my toe right now, it's going to do, 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 do. Only one though, not all of them. Are ready? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, I'm kind of religious. Ready? Here we go. I'm ready? Here we go. Time, talent, and treasure. Watch this. Stewardship is about growing. Listen carefully. It's about growing, God working in us and through us. Stewardship is about serving, allowing God to use us. How many times has somebody been sick or they were having a hard time? And I use this as my, one of my greatest examples, and I'm not just trying to blow somebody's head up. This is so awesome. Bethany only had days to live. Bethany... I was going back to Washington because Linda had the blood clots in her lungs. And they said, don't, I mean, for, for three days there at the hospital, they were pulling the same floor and said, I could lose either one at any time. Okay? So Linda goes home, and I go check on her, spend a couple hours with her, get everything going. DC and them were taking care of Bethany. Then I get up to Bethany. And that day I got visited by several ministers. And it was good, and I appreciate it. I really do. 
But they come in with their guns loaded. You know, I got my gospel gun. I'm just going to blow you away. And there was one guy, I don't know if he if ever had any kind of counseling training or anything. And I just wanted to ask him, could you please be quiet? But I didn't. And I said, Bethany's in there. I want to spend time with her. And he kept, you know, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28. If he said Romans 8, 28 more than 20 times, less than 20 times, it's amazing because he kept saying, right, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28. And I finally said, I'm aware of Romans 8, 28. And he kept on and on and on. And then I said, then I started training him on how to counsel people. And I counseled him for 30 minutes. And he had all he could take. <laughs> And he leaves. I'm really having a hard time. Because Bethany's saying, Daddy, don't stop fighting. Please don't stop fighting. Please don't stop fighting. Give it all you got, Dad. Give it all you got. You and Mama, please just keep on going. We were doing everything we could. We did everything we possibly could. And I'm on the way back to the hospital. And I just watched an episode of Last Man Standing. Trying to find something funny to watch. And it was when Mandy got married. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried because I knew Bethany said all she wanted to do was get married and have babies. And I knew that she would never do that. My nerves were shot. I mean, they were, I, know you, I know you think I'm Superman, but I promise you my cape was in the cleaners and there was kryptonite in every pocket. <laughs> and I get in my car and the phone rings. And I, right to start with, I didn't know who it was. I just heard the phone ring, and I was I hope that's not the hospital. And I pick it up, and I see there's Patrick Baker. So I pick it up and say, what's going on, bro? Here's what he said. He said, I have no idea what to say to you. I have no idea to even try to even understand the way to communicate right now. He said, but I know you're hurting, and I'm here. Can we talk? It took me 30 minutes to get to the hospital. I stayed in the hospital. We stayed in the parking lot another 30 minutes. We talked about anything. Just anything. I got more out of that conversation than, than the head chaplain at the hospital, the preacher with Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28. And when we got through, I thanked Patrick. Because although we didn't talk anything spectacular, we didn't thought anything... This is the most important thing. He showed me that he was there, that he cared, and that he loved me in Bethany. You know what? To this day, I treasure that conversation, Patrick, more than anything. The whole time she was sick, I treasure that conversation. Because when I walked in, I felt renewed. I walked in, there's Bethany. And she's out of it. You know, all this stuff's going on. But I felt so renewed. We didn't talk about Romans 8.28, Romans 8.28, Romans 8.28. We just talked. The difference was he cared. He just, he's even told me, I don't know what to say. And I said, buddy, you just don't have any idea what you have said. It's just awesome. I think we talked about trucks. We talked about donuts. We talked about whatever. You know, I'm not talking about spinning donuts, but the truck talking about donut, donut. And, 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 but you know what? God allowed or Patrick allowed God to use him that night more powerful than guys that come up with a doctor's degrees and even doctors were coming up to me and saying can we give you something for your nerves I said I'm fine and I said well can we give you something we know that you've got to be hurt and I said yeah I'm hurting and the doctor would even grab me crying and would hold me and I said guys it's okay God's got this but what Patrick did that night was he allowed God to use him. And it was very powerful. Then just before she died, there's Brandon. He came in. You know what happened? Again, we didn't have any big theological debates. I just knew two of my best friends. Didn't know what to say, but they were there. They allowed God to use them in probably the toughest time of my life up to that point. So growing, God working in us and through us, serving, allowing God to use you whether you feel qualified or not. Giving, managing God's resources. 
So, so now, that is stewardship in a nutshell. And do you see, although money is in all of that, this is not about money. This is about attitude. This is about priorities. This is about, God, I really want you to use me. So now, we have people talk about, well, I, the preacher just wants money. Well, no, I, I, re, I realize, yeah, you might think I want money. If you see my car, yeah, y'all go ahead and pitch in, and we'll... Matter of fact, I had a Chevette one time. I put a club in it, and somebody broke in the car and stole the club. <laughs> Later, somebody broke in and stole the radio, and they took the car out. <laughs> No, I don't want your money. No, the church don't want your money. We, we need money to operate, but that's not what they want. you got to understand this. Yes, we need money to operate. And it's important for God's kingdom. And God has a way for everything to work smooth. And, and it's like this. You give and it gives it back. The only thing is, whatever size shovel or spoon you use, you get a bigger one coming back to you. So, But that's not what it was. I found out one of the biggest reasons we have a problem with stewardship is because of fear. I'm afraid I'm not enough. I'm afraid God really can't use me. I'm afraid I don't have enough. I'm afraid I haven't learned enough. I'm afraid I'm not old enough. So we're going to talk about stewardship and fear. And I hope that this opens some eyes. I mean, really opens some eyes. So let's, let's get your Bible out. I'll let you sit. Get your Bible out. This is a long scripture. Some of y'all can hardly stand for praise and worship without you can give out. Yeah, Psalm 103 is our scripture. Now, now I'm tugging on y'all. We're just playing. Hopefully y'all know I'm just playing with you. Okay, ready? For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability. He's good at it. His ability to do what he's got to do. And straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received the two had also gained other two. But he that had received one went, y'all say went, and dug in the earth and buried. Y'all say buried. It doesn't say buried, but that's what it means. Say buried. Of course, my wife's from Virginia. She says I don't say it right, so I reckon I'm going to say it her way. I know you're watching, dear. You're taking care of business. Here it is. Buried. Buried. Doesn't even make sense. I ain't never buried anything. I always buried it, okay? All right. After a long time, the Lord and the servants come with and reckon with him. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained with him five more. His Lord said to him, Well done, good, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also said, He also that had received the two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Y'all say buried. Buried. I'm going to say it right. Buried. buried. I don't know how many people up more say buried. buried. Okay. So, a talent, so lo, that, so, and I hid thy talent, I buried in the earth, and lo, thou hast, that is thine. The Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore have put my money to the exchangers, then at my coming I would have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which have ten talents. For every one that, every one that has shall be given, and he, that, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And he cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Therefore there shall be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace, your mercy. I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you for your awesome, awesome ability to meet us where we're at, to help us to see, help us to know and understand, Lord, that our needs are met. I ask you right now, Father, to touch this sermon. God, we know, Lord, that it's tough. Right now is the toughest time I've ever lived in. I know it's got to be tough for everybody else. But we know, God, although the times are tough, you were tougher. And, Father, although we don't understand, we know, God, we know that you got this. Help us, God, to learn to move beyond what frustrates us in our fears and priorities that are out of priority. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said? Amen. Amen. Now, now, I'm going to just sit down and kind of talk a little bit. Is that okay? All right. Let me tell you something. I watch this. Oop, back it up, back it up, back it up. I just hit that button. I'm just getting button happy. Amen. Okay. Simple definition. Stewardship. Practice of managing another's resources. Practice managing another's resources. Now, now, now again, uh, yes, money's involved, but this is more than just money. This is attitude. This is attitude. This is action. This is priority. You know, I know I can't go to Africa, so of course I'm going to give an African missionary money and God's going to bless that because he knows I'm not going to go to Africa, so that's good. But to reach down and help somebody on the side of the road. You walk in Walmart and you see the person in front of you don't have enough money and you have to have some money in your pocket. I'm not talking about they're in there buying a, a carton of cigarettes. They're buying milk for their kids and buying cereal. And you see that they don't have enough money. And you just happen to either drop it on the floor and say, look, is this yours? I've done that. Or just tell the, just look at the cashier and go, you know, I got this. You say, again, remember, and I'm going to go even deeper in a minute, but you say, well, well isn't tithing stewardship? Yes, but stewardship and tithing is two different things. Tithing is part of stewardship. Stewardship will stand on its own, okay? Tithing is given unto God. Stewardship is giving unto others through God, okay? So, so here, let's go ahead and let's just talk a little bit about stewardship. Okay, let's just get something straight right from the dig in. Let's go ahead and clear the air and get over with, okay? The Bible says in Psalms 24 and 1, it says also in 1 Corinthians 10, 26, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Stewardship fact number one. Ready? God owns it all. Oh, yes. Stewardship fact number two. We don't own a thing. I preached a funeral Friday morning. On the way out the door, I get another call from another funeral home and said, can you meet us at 2 o'clock in Chocolate and We've got a funeral and we need somebody there. Both of those funerals I never saw you all being pulled behind the herds. We don't own anything. You say, well, I own my house. I got to pay for it. I got a deed. Try not paying your taxes and show them your deed. You go, you're the one we're going to rest in. I own my car. It's paid for. Well, then show the title to the tax man. You think we own anything? You think we own our children? No, God lend them to us. You think you got your life together and you own your life? No, you don't. No, you don't. So, we don't own anything. Somebody say that. We don't own say, God owns it all. God owns it all. I'm glad He does. I'm so glad He does because I would mess it up if I owned it. Okay? So, now, stewardship fact number three we are called to manage. What God has given us. Wow. Now let me just stop here and park for a minute. 
We're talking about the last days. Talked about them. We've been talking about them at the seven churches. And we've been talking about the last days on Tuesday nights. And, 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 and there is a misnomer. When somebody dies, they say they're getting their reward now. No, they're not getting their reward now. I hate to burst your bubble. They are living. And they are in God's presence. And it's an awesome thing. You can't beat what's going on. But they didn't get their reward when they died. Are you ready? The Bible says, I just read this. Romans 14, 10 and 3. But, thou, but why thou judge thy brother, and why dost thou set, it, uh, set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat. For it is written, as I said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So let's therefore not judge one another anymore, but let this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way, the judgment seat of Christ. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absence, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it's good or bad. Now, let me just tell you something about the judgment seat of Christ. There's two judgments. There's, a, there's the great right throne of judgment, and there's the judgment seat of Christ. Not everybody is going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. Only those that died in Christ will be there. Only those. Do you have to be perfect? No. Did you made mistakes? Yeah. Were you born again? Yes. You're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. It's there where your works are going to be judged. Once you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you don't have to ever worry about hell again. You don't ever worry about anything like that. Sin, devils, nothing. Because once you've died, you're safe, but you haven't received your rewards yet. Why? Because even though you die, what you sow down here continues to grow. So, because of that, when the seven year tribulation is going on and all hell is brought loose on the earth, you can watch and you can see that there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. So while the world's living in fear and fierceness, we're going to be feeding at a feast with the Lamb of God. And it's at this time during the seven year period, we're going to. Go to the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema judgment. Not to decide whether we go to heaven and hell, because if you're at the Bema judgment, you're already safe. You're not going to go to hell. But you're going to be judged for your works on earth. And according to your works on earth, then that decides on your reward in heaven. So you're, you're judged for your works on earth to decide your reward in heaven. So again, it does not decide whether you go to heaven or hell. You're already going to heaven. But that just decides what your rewards are going to be. Now, the judgment, the white throne of judgment, we that are at the judgment seat of Christ will be at the white throne of judgment, but not to be judged. We're going to be standing around to witness it. We're going to witness it. That's it. But what really gets me is this thought. What if somebody you loved Maybe your father, your mother, your children, people that you know, and oh dear, you're standing around the white throne of judgment as a witness, and they come walking up. If you go to the white throne of judgment, you're going to go to the lake of fire. But you're going to find out why. So as you're coming up, can you imagine standing there and you look and there's your dad or your mom or your kids or your brother, your sister or a good friend and they look up and see you as you're getting ready to be taken off and they said, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me about this place? Wow. So you see, stewardship is a whole lot more than Okay? So, it's about sowing. 
and reaping time, time, and treasure. So, so here we go. Let's get a little bit further in this thing. So now, our stewardship is tested here. When we get to the light or to the judgment seat of Christ, our stewardship is tested here, but it's rewarded there. You might not ever get a reward down here for some of the stuff you do. Okay, if you're waiting for somebody to pat you on the back, or you're waiting for somebody to do such and such for you, you may be here a long time. Okay? Your stewardship is tested here, but it's rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? We have an opportunity to give here our time, our talent, and our treasure. But what's for this one? But God has the opportunity to give back to us here and there. Wow. We give here, God gives back here and there. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, But this I say, he that soweth sparingly. Okay, he that soweth sparingly. Wow. He that sows sparingly. I can't say that enough. <laughs> He that sows sparingly, like he's scared to death, that's his last dime, shall also reap sparingly. The Bible says, uh, uh, one verse in the Amplified Version says, Remember, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. But he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according to as he purposes in his heart, so that he give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, listen, number one, your money's involved, but also your time and your talent. Your time, your talent, your treasure. Okay? If I can't be bothered, if I cannot be bothered to go help somebody, or I cannot be bothered to tell somebody about Christ. Or I cannot be bothered to use my talent for God. Or I cannot be bothered to give to God's service. Whether it be my time, my talent, my treasure. Then how I give, give what God's watching. And how I give is how I get it back. Wow. It says, uh, let each of us give as he's made up his own mind and purpose in his heart. Not reluctantly or sorrowfully and under compulsion. You know, D.C., when he was like five, we were starting a church, and D.C. was the usher, and we only had like 10, 15 people, and it was really funny one day because D.C. come up, and, and we had and we had a little bit more people that day, I think probably about 20 people, and D.C. comes up with the offering plate, and I noticed that it was full of money. And I thought, how in the world do we get all this money in this plate? And about that time, he reaches in his pocket, and he puts up his little, his little cap gun and sets it on top of that. What he's been doing is going down each aisle, five years old, giving them the plate and holding the gun on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, will a man rob God? No, but my son will rob you. Come on here. <laughs> so, so again, again, let me, uh, my name is David. I'm your friend. <laughs> Okay, All right. So, so for he takes pleasure in so for unfortunately, uh, God loves he that takes pleasure in uh, take, takes the pleasures in prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon or do or even do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do giver whose heart is in to give. So here's how it works. If I use a teaspoon. God used a teaspoon to give it back. If I use a shovel, God used a bigger shovel. If I, if I, if I, whatever I do, God always outdoes it. He always gives back more. That's how it works. It's always worked that way. It has never changed. And that word cheerful giver, literally in the Greek, that word cheerful is hilarious. How long has it been since you gave of your time, your talent, your treasure? When the offer plate come by, you went, ah, here you go. It's more like, okay, I got about an hour. You can, okay. Well, you want me to sing? I'm going to sing, but I'm only going to use one string. 
Or is it, you know what? Here's an opportunity. Let's do it. Let's give, let's give it all we got to God. Because God's going to take this and do something with it. So stewardship <coughs> equals sowing. <laughs> and the Bible says he went and hid his in the earth. Do you know we don't bury it? We don't bury seeds. We sow seeds. We bury dead people. Let me say that one more time. I've done a bunch of funerals over my life. A bunch. Hundreds. Hundreds of funerals. And we've yet to bury a lot of them. Burying is when you're not expecting life. Sowing is a whole different thing. I so expecting something to come up. I, I tell you what, now, if I've ever been to a funeral, all of a sudden they come out of that coffin, we got a problem. Yeah. I got a lot of faith, but also you can run. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, it wasn't one funny that was a funny. It wasn't funny. I hate saying it's a funny at a funeral, but it was funny. We were at a funeral, and, and there was a ceremony for this guy that was in a lodge, and he had a box. They had a box there, and it said, that when you get through, Pastor, just back up. Stand over here, it's his. So I backed up and I stood over. And they opened up the box. And they said, This dove symbolizes his spirit flying, flying, flying to his master. And he opened up that box. I'm standing here, and the pigeon goes up and parks right there. <laughs> there was a limb right there, and I said, Oh, wait. They were having a ceremony and the pigeon says, or the, 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 the dove was beside him. I said, fly, fly, fly. Then I got to thank him. Maybe that guy wasn't as ready for this as I thought he was. <laughs> All right, so watch this. Stewardship is sowing. Sowing is not burying. Burying is for the dead. Sowing is for the living. I don't give expecting nothing back. I don't expect you to give it back immediately, but when I, when I take care of, you know, it's been a many time over the years, I help somebody and never even thought about it again. And later on, all of a sudden, somebody I know, one of my kids or somebody needs something, and somebody comes up to me and says, you, you know what, let me help you. I remember years ago, I couldn't get this done, or I didn't have enough money, or I didn't this, and your dad come up without, any, without, without being pushed or anything, just said, here, you take care of it. And just like he was good to me 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I'm going to do the same thing for you right now. So I still read. Just maybe not immediately. Because seeds take time to grow. Okay? So stewardship equals sowing. Stewardship equals priorities. Okay? So now, now let's just go, go a little bit further and I'm going to let y'all go and we'll finish some of this up uh, next week. Okay? So, Stewardship. We're all stewards of our time, our talent, our treasure. Anything that he's entrusted to us. And one day, we're all going to be called to give an account of how we managed it. And you, you know what? You can tell me all day long why you didn't and why you won't. Why you couldn't think of this and you didn't have time and you didn't blah, 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 blah. You know what? I can see God up in heaven going. Son, didn't we talk about this last week? Again? You can't find it in your time. Again? All I've given you and you can't give back. Again? And so what you do is Oh, I got something better here. Here we go. You're standing here like this. With your time, your talent, your treasure. I ain't got time, God. They'll understand. You just got to understand. You just got to understand. And God's up in heaven going, look, he's waiting. Ready to pour. 
And when he sees that attitude, he goes. Then the next day, something, you do the same thing. And so he goes. And you're wondering, why do I feel like everything's blocked up against me? Take the gun out of your own hand. It's simple. We want to find somebody else to blame. And sometimes, many times, we've done it to ourselves. So, so here we go. I know, this is a good one. Okay, so y'all say it home soon, then I feel better. Okay, so you're ready. Fear, we're talking about fear, and then we're, I'm going to call it, call it today. Okay? Next week, I promise you, next week's going to be a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready? Ready? Fear. Being driven by fear. I can't even tell you how many people I know that are so driven by fear. I know they say, well, I don't know enough, I'm not old enough, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other, whatever. But the or they just want my money. You know, they just want to volunteer. Well, no. The bottom line is not greed with the person who does want to do it. The bottom line is fear. Fear they're not going to have enough. Fear they're not going to be enough. Fear they're not going to do enough. So what? Fear is a feeling of dread, alarm, panic, anxiety. It's a learned response. Did you know that? It's a learned response. We learn to be afraid. How many times is, how many times have, you know, I remember mama always telling me, watch how you cross that road. And she called me cricket. It's my nickname, cricket. She goes, cricket! You watch both ways when you cross that road. I don't need my son to get flat. And so here we are on Highway 55 in Merritt. And the car, I see a car coming to you where we lived. You can see the one bridge or you can see the other, and they were way far away. And we were sitting there. If we see the least little car come, we'd wait till all the cars come by. Kind of like some driver when I got behind the other day. <laughs> and I wait for everybody to go by. Because every time I get in that car road, I'd hear, I'm 61 years old, and I can go across the street, I hear, Cricket! <laughs> My mama died in 97. And still, to this day, if I go across that road to go to fellowship hall, I hear, Cricket! <laughs> That's the truth. But I had to learn to overcome that. Because although she was instilling good fear in her, in her, and she's a great mom, but in her endeavors to instill good fear, bad fear leaked in. And I had to learn the difference in good fear and bad fear. So, so here it is. So watch this now. If you don't get it under control, eventually it's going to produce negative circumstances. And that's what happened here. Eventually we begin to operate driven by fear. It paralyzes our decision-making process. It mobilizes our actions. It hinders our prayers. It limits our faith. It restricts relationships. It lowers productivity. It jeopardizes health. And it stifles joy. <sighs> That's a lot, isn't it? Well, it affects every area of your life. Even your stewardship. This story deals with the danger of fear Driven stewardship. Well, here it is. Okay, here we go. Come on up, brother. I know you're there. Here it comes. Dun, 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 dun. There you go. 
Fear does not prevent death. It prevents life. Wow. Fear does not prevent death. It prevents life. So now, let's just do, we're going to do this and then we're going to close. If your stewardship is built on faith, or your stewardship is built on fear. I'm going to help you decide right now. I'm going to give you a chance so you can figure this out. Take notes, write them down. You ain't got to show the person next to you. I'm going to let you see if your stewardship, how you use your time and talent and your treasures, It was built on faith or built on fear. You ready? It was built on faith. I trust him. Remember telling you about me and me and Brandon out of at, out out at uh, uh, Krispy Kreme that night, and that lady came up to us out of nowhere. She came out of nowhere, and she wanted money to buy arthritis medicine, and her fingers. He'll tell you her fingers were like this. I don't know how she could even move, maneuver. And she said, sir, I just need like $8.32 or whatever. I just need that to get my medicine. And Brandon only had a card. And I reached in my pocket and Brandon said, watch him have it. And I had $8.32 in my pocket. <laughs> I give it to her. We prayed. She prayed for us. She goes walking away, and honestly, I don't know where she went. But you know what? That was very small. It was 32 cents, but at the same time, it was everything I had. She's sitting there in front of us like this. It was not a joke. You could see her knuckles were, they were bad. And I said, do you need any more money? Do you need more? She says, no, all I need is $8.32 to get my medicine. No more. No less. But it was everything I had. Here's my test. I could have reached in my pocket and said, well, I'll give you half of it. I could reach in my pocket and go, well, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll go try to talk to my No. I reached around my pocket, pulled it out. And there it was. So I gave it to her. Because I trusted God. Active. I pulled it out of my pocket. Everything I owned at that moment, as far as money in my pocket, and I gave it to her. But it started increasing after I let go of it. The reason it increased is because I felt the witness of the Spirit hit me when we couldn't find where she went. All I could think of that, we just entertained an angel. And God has rewarded me time and time and time again for stuff like that. That's how you know if your stewardship is built on faith. Today, I know I'm not the best singer. Y'all don't have to. Somebody say, no, you're really doing good. Somebody say, Y'all got to build me up a little bit. I, I said, I'm really good at singing. Not some people go, you can say that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, y'all. I thank you. There you go. I'll give you a quarter. It's worth a quarter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But you know what? DC's working the rescue squad. I'm, you know, I, I don't know where BJ's at. But you know what? Me and Brandon come here and say, you know what? I just don't have praise and worship today. No. Trusting God. Putting the base there, Paul. Getting active. And God's going to bless you. Okay, now why can build on fear? You ready? Distrust. If your stewardship is built on fear, there's distrust. Either you don't trust yourself, you don't trust God, or you don't trust what's going on. Am I going to have enough? Am I enough? Can I do enough? Then think of those questions. Will I have enough? Can I do enough? Am I enough? It's on distrust. And so what you do is, instead of reaching out, like that lady that night, I could look at that lady and said, you know, because people are always asking for money. Remember I told you that day, 
you know, I was talking about the gas station, and the, the next time I stopped at that gas station, between services, I stopped at that gas station, the guy rides on his bicycle, and hollers, hey man! And I said, uh-oh. He said, hey dude! And I said, why? It was raining. He's out in the road. And says, man, you got any money? I said, why don't you come up here out of the rain? I said, what are you doing out in the road? He said, they won't let me up there. I said, why not? I said, because I've been panhandling. Asking for money. I said, are you hungry? He said, yeah. I said, well, come up here and get something to eat. I can't go in there. They won't let me in. So we go to another store across the street. And I found out he wouldn't come in there either because they won't let him in there because he'd been asking for money. But at least I, you know what? I thought about it. I got him hot dogs and I got him potato chips. I got him something to drink. I got him more than he asked for. And I come out and gave it to him. And I rode away, and I said, God, I just talked about this Sunday, so I know this is a test. So I'm going to pass this test tonight. I'm going to pass it. See, distrust, inactive. That woman could have come up to us that night, and I could have said, who are you fooling? She weren't fooling anybody. They were real. That was real. You know, I could have said, we ain't got any money. Although I had eight dollars, I had the exact change in my pocket. She did not know what I had in my pocket. I didn't even know what I had in my pocket. The only person who knew what I had in my pocket was God. As I put it back in my pocket, my time, my time, my treasures, my stewardship decreases to the point where. I am no longer a channel to which God works His blessings. I only become a vessel where God pours it in, and God pours it in, and God pours it in, and it rolls over. But I'm never effective because I'm just sitting there getting fat off the land, coming in, coming in, coming in, thinking I'm not going to have enough, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to be a vessel. I want to be a channel. I want God to flow through me. It's built on faith. You're a vessel. I mean, you're a channel. It's built on fear. You're a vessel. It just comes in, and that's it. Instead of being rewarded, you slowly, spiritually, dry up. And everything you were afraid of Because then you're not enough. You don't have enough. You can't be enough. The choice is ours. Not God's. It's not Satan's. It's our choice. Stewards. Stewards. Brandon, come on up here, brother. And strum us up. Stewards. Stewards. Do I sow in other people's lives? I think this is your question. Do I sow in other people's lives? Do I sow into my children? Do I sow good things into my spouse? Do I sow things at my place of business? Do I sow things on my job? Do I sow in my church? Do I sow believing that God's going to increase me and I'm going to, I'm going to grow spiritually or am I going to until I fulfill that prophecy? And I don't have enough. And I'm not enough. I refuse to live by fear. God has so much in store for us. But fear is the exact opposite of faith. This steward, there was three of them. One got five, one got two, one got one. The other guys went and sowed there. We'll talk about this next week. They sowed it. But the one guy buried, buried his. Buried it. And because he buried his, he lost what he had. Because when you bury it, thinking you're going to save it, 
Something's come up. And I went out in my car and got my stuff to come in with him. Because I saw stewardship in action. It was powerful. Very, very powerful. You'll never know how, how powerful, how much power that was given, to, given in my life and hope that day. Did he come in with a cape on? No. Did he come in with no? He come in with a tool pouch.
early on, I said, Brother Hazlett, y'all heard me say this before, I said, Brother Hazlett, when do I stop getting butterflies every time I step in the pulpit? He said, Brother, when you do, you don't get up in the pulpit. You sit down. He said, because when you, when you don't get butterflies, and now I'm having allergies, then you have stopped leaning on God and started leaning on yourself. God's got this. God's got it. Amen. Everyone want hearts and minds clear? They're looking good with the exception of a couple of them. But y'all know who you are, so that's okay. <laughs> Brother Doug, we just missed some prayer, please. Let's pray. Father, good Lord, thank you for this message. Lord, we know that you were just asking us to do what you've already done for us. Lord, let our actions speak for you.